This hearing is called to order. Uh, I'm looking at the title of the hearing, Jihad 2.0, Social Media in the Next Evolution of Terrorist Recruitment. Uh, I'm unfortunate, I think that's, unfortunately, I think that's a wrong title. It's really the current evolution of terrorist recruitment. We've got uh, a panel of, I think, some excellent witnesses to, to lay out the reality, which is what we're always trying to do in this committee is, uh, if you're going to solve a problem, you have to first recognize, acknowledge that reality. Uh, and so I think we've got a, a good panel. Uh, I'd ask consent to uh, enter my written opening statement in the record. And it's, and it's always granted because our ranking member is such a kind gentleman. Uh, what I'd like to do is uh, talk a little bit about a ISIS message that warns of 71 trained soldiers in 15 U.S. states, 23 signed up for missions. And I'm just going to read some excerpts in here because... You know, first, let me say, we, we have no knowledge whether this is true or not. I think uh, as some of our witnesses will probably say it's, it's bluster. Let's hope so. But th this is a perfect example of what ISIS is, is trying to do and how they're trying to use social media. Uh, their post, and of course, this is claiming credit for the terrorist attacks in Texas. Uh, excerpts read, the attack by the Islamic State in America is only the beginning of our efforts to establish a province in the heart of our enemy. We knew that the target was protected. Our intention was to show how easy we give our lives for the sake of Allah. Out of the 71 trained soldiers, 23 have signed up for missions like Sunday. We are increasing in number. Of the 15 states, five we will name, Virginia, Maryland, Illinois, California, and Michigan. The disbelievers who shot our brothers think that you killed someone untrained. Nay, they gave their bodies in plain view because we were watching. They go on to say the next six months will be interesting. Let's hope not. Um, as I'm being briefed for this hearing, uh, and by the way, the, the, the reason we always call these hearings is I got questions. Uh, I need to understand what these problems are. But, uh, so I'm, I'm always learning a lot, and I'm going to learn a lot more th through the testimony, but I like timelines. And so I had my staff prepare just for 2015 the timeline of potential terrorist plots that have been, that have been foiled, uh, the arrests that we've been made by individuals who've been inspired by, by ISIS and other Islamic terrorists. And you go through the list. Uh, we had Christopher Lee from Cincinnati, Ohio, who's planning to come to the U.S. Capitol to bomb and then with two semi-automatic uh, weapons uh, open, open fire on people fleeing the Capitol. That was on January 14th. Uh, February 25th, three Brooklyn men were arrested. March 17th, a former U.S. Air Force veteran was arrested after a failed attempt to cross the border into Syria. March 25th, an Army National Guard specialist was arrested after planning to travel to Syria. April 2nd, two women were arrested in Queens, New York. April 3rd, a Philadelphia woman was arrested before she could travel to Syria. April 8th, this one hits a little bit closer to home because this is a gentleman from, not gentleman, a man from Madison, Joshua Ray Van Haften, was arrested in Chicago O'Hare Airport after his flight landed from Turkey. April 10th, John T. Book was arrested in Topeka after it was discovered he was preparing a car bomb for use against nearby, nearby Fort Riley Army Post. April 16th, another indictment. April 19th, six men arrested on terrorism charges. April 3rd, the Texas terrorist attempt. Um, we've got a chart that I think is also somewhat surprising. So again, the, the point of that timeline is the, these arrests the revelations of these things are growing, and they're, they're, they're increasing in frequency. Uh, another, I thought relatively shocking, as I was being briefed by my staff, I, you know, I, I was saying, is this true? That the number of terrorist attacks in 2012 around the world was 6,771, and 2013, 9,700? And one of my staff members went, wow, which was exactly my reaction. Uh, 2012, 11,000 individuals killed in terrorist attacks, it grew by 61% to almost 18,000 in 2013. Now, in this chart, we've also broken that up between terrorist attacks in Afghanistan, Syria, Iraq, and Pakistan. I guess I'd consider those war zones. But that still leaves almost 3,000 terrorist attacks in 2012 outside of those war zones, almost 4,000 in 2013, an increase of about 33.8%. So the, the point of this hearing is to show that the danger is real. In many respects, the threat is growing. And we're going to have testimony here that there, there actually have been some setbacks for ISIS. They're maybe not as strong as, as they purport to be. But they're using social media 
to prepare to sh show that they're actually stronger than they are to inspire the kind of action and they don't need a whole lot of territory uh, they don't need too many computers they don't need too many people uh, spewing that hate and provide that kind of information or inspiration so this is a real threat um, I, I really want to thank and, and welcome the witnesses for your thoughtful testimony and coming here. And, and uh, with that, I'm turn, we'll turn it over to our ranking member for his opening comments. Thank, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, to each of you, welcome. This is a, an excellent panel, and we look forward to hearing from you and having a chance to ask uh, questions of, of you this, uh, this morning. Uh, th as this committee has discussed uh, a number of hearings over the, uh, the years, the threats that, uh, that our, our country faces in the uh, the chairman has just given us a, a sort of a, a quick look at what's going on this year. But the, the nature of the threat has evolved significantly since 9-11 since when I was uh, a new member of this, uh, this committee. After 9-11, the most uh, acute uh, terrorist uh, threats came from Osama bin Laden's al-Qaeda, which had orchestrated, as we know, large, complex attacks from remote caves in Afghanistan. Today, bin Laden is dead. The core of al-Qaeda, as we knew it, has been largely dismantled. Uh, unfortunately, al-Qaeda affiliates in Yemen, in Africa, and in Syria have filled the void. At the same time, new terror groups like ISIS present an immediate and different kind of threat to, uh, to the U.S. and others, both here and, and, and abroad. While the threat of major aviation attacks still remains a top concern for American counterterrorism officials, the tactics involved, employed by these groups who are targeting us have broadened and are not as focused on this uh, particular type of uh, attack method. Uh, groups like ISIS, like uh, al-Shabaab and al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula have used social media and online, online propaganda to spread uh, their call to extremists here in America and around the world to carry out their own attacks against us. Moreover, ISIS has seemingly perfected the ability to use show social media to lure Western recruits to Syria for training. These new tactics mean that we can no longer rely solely on our ability to use military force to eliminate a terrorist threat. We must, in partnership with our allies uh, abroad, uh, start examining more closely the root causes of why Westerners join the ranks and act in the name of ISIS or al-Qaeda. We must uh, continue to evolve our own counterterrorism tactics to address these root causes. And today we'll begin to examine the narratives put forward by these terrorist groups over social media and also how those narratives are being used to influence uh, vulnerable individuals here and in other Western countries. And we will look for common sense solutions that our government, along with other governments with whom we're allied, can employ to counter these groups' uh, narratives and to eliminate this tool from terrorist toolbox. And with that, I look forward to a good conversation here. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Senator Carper. It is the tradition of this committee to swear in, in uh, witnesses, so if you all stand and raise your right hand. Do you swear the testimony you will give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Thank you. Please be seated. Our first witness is Peter Bergen. Uh, Mr. Bergen is the director of the National Security Studies Program at the New American Foundation, CNN's national security analyst and the author of Manhunt, the 10-year search for bin Laden from 9-11 to Abbottabad, and the longest war, the enduring conflict between America and al-Qaeda. Uh, Mr. Bergen. Thank you, Senator Johnson. Thank you, Senator Carper. Thank you, other members of the committee and, and the excellent staff that put this hearing together. Um, my task today is to kind of try and outline um, the threat from Americans inspired by the Syrian conflict, uh, which is the n newest wave and cohort of uh, domestic uh, jihadism in the United States. And we at the New America Foundation, where I work, have identified 62 individuals uh, from news uh, reports or public records uh, who have uh, tried to join ISIS, have joined ISIS, or, or Nusra, the Al-Qaeda affiliate, or have supported others doing so. And here are the sort of big takeaways. Uh, they come from across the United States. We found uh, cases in 19 states. As you know, uh, FBI Director James Comey has said there are ongoing investigations in 50 states. Some of these are obviously not public yet. They don't fit any ethnic profile. Whether there are whites, there are African Americans, there are the Arab Americans, there are Pakistani Americans, there are Bosnian Americans. And this, of course, uh, produces uh, problems for law enforcement in the sense that, unlike in the case of al-Shabaab, which attracted overwhelmingly Somali Americans, mostly from Minnesota, where Senator Johnson uh, went to university, I believe, um, 
it, that was a very focused uh, group of uh, uh, who were going. This is across the United States. We also found an unprecedented number of American females. I mean, typically, you know, obviously, these are a group of highly miso misogynistic individuals whose goal in life is to preclude women from having any role outside the home. home. And yet, we found uh, about a fifth of the, of the 62 are, are females. A number of them are teenagers. Uh, and uh, this is really a, a, new, a, a very new phenomenon. They were also, we also found that this is a relatively young group. The average age is 25, but there are teenagers, including teenage girls as young as 15. The only profile that, these, that this group really shared, 52, 53 of the 62 individuals were very active on social media, downloading and sharing jihadist propaganda, and in some cases, as Elton Simpson was doing, directly communicating with members of ISIS uh, in Syria. And, you know, this is uh, a new development in the way uh, jihadist terrorists are, are, are recruiting in the United States. You know, the kind of conventional view or perhaps the cartoonish view is an al-Qaeda recruiter comes here and recruits somebody and, uh, and, and creates a cell. In fact, that's very rare. Uh, that did happen in Lackawanna. You may remember the Lackawanna 6 uh, case where there was an al-Qaeda recruiter who recruited six uh, Yemeni Americans from Buffalo to New York to go to uh, uh, a training camp in Afghanistan. We also saw that also in Minnesota in 2007 when veterans of the Somali war went to Minneapolis to recruit Americans physically and bring them to Somalia. But that is, we're no longer seeing that model at all. In fact, of the 62 individuals, we found that none of them were physically recruited by a militant operative, radical cleric, returning foreign fighter, or were radicalized while in prison. Instead, they recruited on, self recruited online or were sometimes in touch via Twitter with members of ISIS in Syria. Um, why would uh, Americans abandon what is, after all, a, usually a very comfortable life? A lot of these uh, come, from, uh, you know, come from comfortable backgrounds and are intelligent uh, individuals. Why would they be attracted to uh, ISIS? And I think there are sort of perhaps three reasons. First of all, of course, the terrible nature of Assad's brutal war against his own people uh, is, a, is an attraction. Secondly, the claim that the ISIS has created the caliphate, uh, which I think is a powerful attraction for, for idealistic uh, fundamentalist Muslims. Uh, thirdly, ISIS is presenting itself as the vanguard of... Uh, of uh, the, the, the sort of Muslim army that is signaling the end of times and that it is basically the, the, the vanguard of a group that will usher in uh, you know, the, the perfect uh, true Islam when the Mahdi, the savior of Islam, returns. Now, uh, you know, I, I was just uh, this morning uh, looking up, uh, saw that a very large number of Americans, something like four in ten, believe that we are in the end times. So this is not a, such an uncommon view that we're in the end times. So, uh, ISIS is presenting itself as ushering in the end times, which is another powerful kind of attraction. It also presents itself as a real state with social services, and that claim is not completely false, uh, although it's certainly uh, probably less true than it, they present it. And for some of the Western recruits, this is a heroic and glamorous uh, thing. We, we, we've seen people tweet on uh, ISIS. Uh, we've seen ISIS fighters say that it's like playing, the call of call, playing Call of Duty, but in 3D. And so there's a heroic exciting aspect of this that is attracting people. And finally, what is the true level of threat? And I would say the true level of threat in the West is, is, is not as much as, uh, something like 80% of Americans believe that ISIS, ISIS is a serious or fairly serious threat to the United States. Well, it may be a threat, it's clearly a big threat to American interests in the Middle East potentially, but so far only one Syrian foreign fighter uh, has carried out a successful attack in the West, which was the Frenchman who uh, attacked the Jewish Museum in Brussels on May 24, 2014, killing four people. Uh, not that, of course, uh, doesn't mean that the threat doesn't exist. Uh, it's worrisome, but, but not ex existential. And, and related to that point, uh, of the 19 individuals we found who went to Syria, or uh, eight of them were killed over that. So Syria is proving as much of a, a, of a graveyard as a launch pad for attacks. It's a very dangerous uh, war, as you know. In fact, about half of the, of the men who've uh, gone over there have been killed in a larger sample of about 600 foreign fighters that we've examined, uh, and about 5% of the females. So even for the women, it's, it's uh, very dangerous. Um, so the, if, if the returning uh, foreign fighters are not the issue, uh, what is the issue? And the issue is really what we saw on Sunday, which is people inspired by ISIS uh, taking up uh, weapon, you know, obviously it's easy to acquire weapons in this country and doing something with them. And luckily, uh, Sunday's attack didn't uh, uh, mature in the way that the attackers wanted to. Uh, but I think that is a harbinger of what we will see in the future. Um, so the real issue is not 
Syrian foreign fighters coming back to the United States. Law enforcement has done a very good job of tracking these folks. If they come back, they're all, they're all, there's only one case where law enforcement didn't recognize that a particular person had gone to Syria, which is the Floridian owner Abu Salah. Uh, but the returnee problem is really, I think, much less of an issue than the homegrown uh, ISIS-inspired that we saw on Sunday. Uh, and there's very little, uh, as a practical matter, that we can prevent lone wolves who are truly lone wolves from from doing these kinds of attacks. The good news is there's a natural ceiling to what a lone wolf can do. Uh, you know, uh, for instance, in Boston, the two Sarnia brothers were lone wolves. Uh, they killed four people. Those were individually tragedies, and it was a terrible day for the United States and Boston, but it wasn't a national catastrophe like 9-11 was. So we have to frame the threat, the threat uh, effectively, which is it's worrisome, but not ex existential, and nothing on the scale of 9-11. Uh, our next witness is J.M. Berger. Mr. Berger is a non-resident fellow in the Project on U.S. Relations with the Islamic World at the Brookings Institute and the author of Jihad Joe, Americans Who Go to War in the Name of Islam and ISIS, the State of Terror. Mr. Bergen. Thank you for having me. Uh, I think that I'd like to start by talking about the lone wolf threat because that's obviously on everyone's minds after the events of this weekend. Um, ISIS is, in many ways, appears to be the first jihadist group to really kind of crack the lone wolf formula. Uh, the, the idea of leaderless resistance and individual attacks goes back to the 1980s, originated in the American white supremacist movement, and people have been trying to make it work ever since. And the problem with lone wolves is that it's too easy to stay at home, generally. People are not going to get adequately motivated to carry out an attack without having social reinforcement, and that defeats the purpose of being a lone wolf, is to escape detection by not talking to anyone. Um, ISIS has mixed up this formula, and they, there are a couple of reasons for this. The first thing that they've done that is different from what al-Qaeda did is they have become a populist movement. So they have a very low threshold for entry, and they're pretty undiscriminating about who they include in their group relative to al-Qaeda, it was very difficult to join al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda was a, a vanguard, an elitist movement. So that affords them access to more people. Uh, secondly, their propaganda is extremely violent, uh, and it is also very focused on presenting the group as dynamic and action-oriented uh, relative, again, you know, when you look at a comparison to al-Qaeda, uh, Al-Qaeda's propaganda in recent years especially tends more toward discourse. Uh, we're trying to convince people that we have the right idea, that we, we reasonable people would agree with us that this is the correct thing to do. And uh, ISIS doesn't care about that so much. They're willing to just get people agitated and cut them loose. The third element of change is that ISIS has change the sort of fundamental underlying assumption that we see in, in the jihadist argument. Al-Qaeda proceeded from an assumption of weakness. Uh, its argument was based on the, the prep proposition that Muslims were weak uh, and that they were unable to stand up to apostate regimes in the region as well as, and the reason that they couldn't stand up to them was because the West was behind them. So the idea behind al-Qaeda and the idea behind using terrorism as a tactic was that this is the tool of the weak. We have to degrade popular support in the United States for apostate regimes in the Middle East, and then the United States will withdraw its support, and then we'll be able to fight these guys directly. ISIS has skipped ahead to fighting directly. Uh, the, their propaganda emphasizes this. They are, they are taking the fight to the local regimes, and they are attacking the United States in, in a secondary way. Uh, their message is that we're winners, uh, and you should join us because we're strong. All of this is part of a, a very complex set of problems. Uh, there, we're in a period of very broad social change. Uh, people have been talking about social media for a number of years. And, and often in very effusive terms about how it's changing the world. And this is the first manifestation of how that really is going to work. What we're seeing is that social media allows people to self-select the beliefs and information that they receive. So if you have an interest in jihadism, 
uh, you can find other people who are interested in that very easily, very quickly, and you can establish relationships with them. Uh, this is very different from, say, the 1950s. If you were a radical jihadist in the 1950s living in Peoria, you might go your whole life without meeting anybody who shared your views. Today, it takes you 10 minutes to start talking to people who share your views. And that's a key part of what ISIS does in its recruitment process, is it provides a social context. It's reinforcement, it's personal validation of your beliefs. Um, if you're going to act out as a lone wolf, they're offering you a degree of fame that you would not be able to achieve as a mass shooter, for instance. Uh, and it's, uh, it's very reciprocal. Um, there's a sense of remote intimacy on social media that can be hard to appreciate if you don't use it a lot. When you talk to somebody on a social media platform and you talk to them every day, you feel like you know them. You feel like they're somebody who's in your life. And so somebody tweeting from Syria who is a member of ISIS can develop a very emotionally powerful relationship with somebody who's sitting in the United States. And that is part of the reason that, they, that we have seen people are more willing to mobilize in the name of ISIS than they were in the name of Al-Qaeda. ISIS's radicalization and recruitment practices take place over a spectrum. Uh, there's no one thing that they do to try and recruit Westerners or try and recruit locally. They attack this from, from every channel, in every direction, uh, using a variety of styles and using a very large number of people because ISIS is a large organization. It can afford to have 2,000 people who tweet 150 times every day. Uh, it can afford to have a ratio of, you know, two or three recruiters to every one potential recruit who might carry out a lone wolf attack. Um, if there's an area in which we are, we are trailing ISIS in this struggle, I think it's probably a question of resources. Um, and, of course, the problem that we face with that is that nobody can really agree how to use those resources. Our, our efforts at countering violent extremism in a preventive way have a lot of problems that are inherent to them. Uh, and we also have a problem from a law enforcement perspective. If you're monitoring 60 or 100 people, it takes 500 people to do that, to monitor these people even on a partial basis, let alone 24 hours a day. So if these guys jump in a car and drive to Texas, there's not a lot you can do to interdict that. Um, I'll save most of the rest of my thoughts for the Q&A. I did want to just talk about the prospect of an ISIS organizational terrorist attack. Um, ISIS has money and manpower to spare. Uh, we have not seen that they have an intent to carry out a 9-11 style attack and there's reason to think they might not be as skilled or competent in such an attempt as Al-Qaeda was because of the training cycles that they use. Um, I think we should not assume that that's something that couldn't happen though, that they couldn't make an attempt. And I think we're much better prepared to prevent something like that today. Um, I don't think ISIS is an existential threat, but I do think that we have to have realistic expectations about what they might do so that when something happens, we don't overreact and in fear. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Berger. Our next witness is Mubin Sheikh. Uh, Mr. Sheikh is a former Muslim extremist and an expert on radicalization, terrorism, and countering violent extremism. He, he has consulted on the topic of ISIS with the U.S. State Department, uh, U.S. National Counterterrorism Center, U.S. Special Operations Command, Central Command, NATO, Interpol, and other agencies. Uh, first of all, Mr. Sheikh, I, I certainly appreciate and, and thank your Thank you for having a change of heart after 9-11 and for all the, the help and support uh, you've given uh, this government uh, in terms of trying to counteract this and also trying to help uh, other young people who might be inspired uh, not be inspired. But uh, looking forward to your testimony. Mr. Sheikh. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, shalom Aleichem, Salam Aleikum, and the, the, the greeting of Jesus Christ, peace be unto you, uh, to the esteemed members of the Senate Committee. On September 11, 2001, I was driving to work when I first heard a plane had struck one of the two towers of the World Trade Center buildings. Immediately, I exclaimed aloud, Allahu Akbar, God is great. My celebratory moment was quickly muted when I asked myself, what if the very office building I was working in was similarly struck by a plane? I would have perished along with everyone else, just as those innocent people perished on that day. For me, September 11, 2001 was, for all intents and purposes, the beginning of the end of my commitment to the extremist mindset. 
Allow me to explain uh, how this began for me. I, I was born and raised in Toronto, Canada to Indian immigrants. As a child, I grew up attending a very conservative brand of madrasa, it's a Quran school, an imported version of what you would find in India and Pakistan. Rows of boys separated from the girls, sitting at wooden benches, rocking back and forth, reciting the Quran in Arabic, but not understanding a word of what was being read. Contrast that with my daily life of attending public school, which was the complete opposite of the rigid fundamentalist manner of education of the madrasa. Here I could actually talk to girls and have a normal functional relationship with them. When I left uh, the Quran school at age 12 and moved into middle school and high school, I wasn't discriminated against, bullied, picked on, or anything of the like. I was actually one of the cool kids. Uh, but when I was 17, I had a house party while my parents were away, which my hyper-conservative uncle walked in on. Uh, normal as it may be to the Western experience, my uncle and other family members were incensed that I would have brought non-Muslim friends to my home, and they spent the next few days berating me over what I had done. Due to the sustained guilt trip I received, the only way I thought I could make amends with my family was to quote-unquote get religious, uh, hence the born-again types seeking to right the wrongs of their past. I would then travel to India and Pakistan, and in the latter ended up in a place called Quetta, which unbeknownst to me at the time was the center of the Taliban Shura and of the group known as Al-Qaeda. As I walked around the area, I chanced upon ten heavily armed men dressed in black turbans, flowing robes and sandals. One of them said to me that if you truly wish to bring about political change, it can only be done by using this, and he held aloft his AK-47. I was completely enamored by them as jihadi heroes, a consistent theme in jihadist literature and media today. In the years following, I absorbed myself in proclaiming that jihad was the only way to change things. And when Osama bin Laden gave his fatwa in 1998, I was on board. Then 9-11 happened, and I thought, wait a second, I get attacking combatants, but this, office buildings in which regular people worked, Muslims included? I realized I needed to study the religion of Islam properly to make sense of what I had just witnessed. I sold my belongings and moved to Syria in early 2002, when there was still some semblance of normality in the country. I attended the class of a Syrian Islamic scholar who challenged me on my views regarding jihad and subsequently spent a year and a half with him studying the verses of the Qur'an and the traditions of the Prophet, peace be upon him, that the jihadists use to justify their hate and destruction. I came to relinquish my views completely and return to Canada in 2004 with a newfound appreciation for rights for Muslims in the West. That year, some individuals uh, had been arrested in the UK uh, on, uh, with the London fertilizer bomb plot. One of those individuals was none other than my classmate from the madrasa that I attended as a child. I thought this to be a mistake, contacted the Canadian Security Intelligence Service to give a character reference for the family, but it was too late for him. As for me, I was recruited by the service as an undercover operative because I felt this was my religious duty. I can say that I conducted several infiltration operations both online and on the ground involving religious extremists. One of those cases moved on to become a criminal investigation and I traversed from the intelligence service to the Mounted Police uh, Integrated National Security Enforcement Team in what came to be known as the Toronto 18 Terrorism Prosecution. I gave fact, fact witness testimony in five hearings over four years at the Superior Court where 11 individuals were eventually convicted. I've since worked with various mechanisms of the U.S. government, uh, as you noted, the National Counterterrorism Center, a Homeland Security Office for Civil Rights and Civil Liberties, and the U.S. Department of State Center for Strategic Counterterrorism Communications, three main outfits uh, that are engaged in the study and practice of countering violent extremism programming. In addition, I've spent the past few years on Twitter, having watched the very start of the foreign fighter phenomenon, and directly observed recruitment and propaganda by ISIS types online. And I reference Appendix A uh, here that the members should have. I've directly, I've engaged with many of them, male and female, Appendix B, uh, as well as some of their victims that they have tried to recruit. My approach is to show how wrong they are and to criticize and delegitimize them from the very Islamic sources that they misquote and mutilate. Thusly, the correct term to describe these tics, terrorists in Islamic costume, is khawarij. It's a technical Islamic term. I personally intervened in cases of an American girl that these predators were trying to lure away and put a stop to it by engaging her online as someone who can show her the real interpretation of Islam. Due to this, I, I believe I have a good understanding of what is happening in terms of recruitment and what needs to be done in terms of counter-messaging both from the civic service and the NGO side as well as the military side of psychological operations, uh, which I conveyed at a recent SOCOM conference held in New York in which the commanding general himself was present. Finally, there remains a massive gap in all of the areas that I've mentioned and that a sustainable, meaningful, and effective counter-messaging approach needs to be created. 
I submit to you that it is not as hard as some may suggest, that we already have the talent, but just need the direction and guidance in order to get it going. Uh, just three quick points on, uh, there was some, some question on terrorist recruitment in prisons. Uh, number one, terrorist recruitment in prisons is happening all over the world, uh, not just in the U.S. But as for the U.S., the numbers are actually very low. Number two, in the Western context, much of this recruiting remains unseen to the untrained eye and also due to its covert nature and usually does not manifest openly in the prison institution but afterwards when the individual has left the facility. And number three, greater vetting of the types of imams that offer counseling is needed to ensure that pro-social messaging is delivered in the context of prison rehabilitation programs. By framing this under pro-social messaging, the state avoids having to declare which version of Islam they approve of, since we all approve of anything that promotes healthy, productive, and rehabilitative components of, uh, components of counseling. I thank the committee and my colleagues here with me and hope this is a start of a solid discussion in dealing with the challenges and opportunities now before us. Thank you and God bless. Thank you, Mr. Sheikh. Our next witness is David Gartenstein Ross. Am I pronouncing that even close? That's correct. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's very unusual, by the way. Uh, Mr. Gartenstein Ross is a senior fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, an adjunct assistant professor in Georgetown U University's Security Studies Program a lecturer at the Catholic University of America and author of the report Homegrown Terrorists in the U.S. and the U.K. Mr. Gartenstein Ross. Senator Johnson, Senator Carper, distinguished members, it's an honor to appear before you today. What I'm going to focus on in this testimony is the question of what has the U.S. done, what can the U.S. role be in countering this violent messaging? Uh, with respect to ISIS, uh, which I think right now is rightly at the center of our concerns, We've seen the most dramatic brand rise of any jihadist organization, in large part because of the reasons that J.M. Berger lays out, that they are excellent at messaging. Um, technically, they go far beyond what uh, al-Qaeda and others have done, and they take advantage of Web 2.0, the interactivity of the Internet, which suddenly makes someone who's alone a part of a group. Uh, they also are vulnerable, though it's not inevitable, to the most dramatic brand reversal of any jihadist organization we've seen. Uh, you might have noticed that at times, IS's messaging and the US's counter-messaging have been exactly the same. Often the US will show the Islamic State's brutality, uh, people that they're, they're killing, uh, people that they've tortured, and the Islamic State proudly proclaims the same thing. The reason why is what they have fundamentally is a winner's messaging. To them, it's not bad to show that they're brutal because the brutality shows that they are stronger than other groups, that they can impose their will. Uh, they're actually very recently, as the Islamic State has increasing pressure on it, uh, particularly uh, being concerned about the pressure being put on Mosul, um, a, a statement by a supporter named Abu Suleiman al-Jabadi, which was very insightful. It, it asked people in Islamic State-held cities not to show the brutality of the Islamic State's enemies not to show, for example, bombing that kills civilians, not to show the impact of a siege upon the cities. His argument was that the Islamic State, in its messaging, will show the brutality of its foes, but that brutality is always connected to punishment. In other words, they want to show that they can deal with their problems. That's what a winner's messaging is. They emphasize their strength. They don't want to emphasize weakness. Now, the reason why we know that they are vulnerable to a brand reversal is because we've seen that before with the exact same organization. Back in 2005 to 2006, you had a very similar dynamic, not identical, but very similar, with Al-Qaeda in Iraq, which is, of course, ISIS's predecessor. Al-Qaeda in Iraq was known for its brutality. It shocked people with its videos where they beheaded their victims. And uh, it was uh, thought of as a very romantic organization. People wondered during this period if the emir of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, had surpassed Osama bin Laden as the leading figure of the jihadist world. But what happened then? We, we remember, of course, from Iraq in the 2007 through 2009 period that they had overplayed their hand, particularly in Anbar province, where right now they're in the process of inflicting uh, similar, although greater, brutality upon the population. You saw a grassroots uprising known as the Awakening or the Sahwa movement, uh, and combined with two other factors, a surge of U.S. troops in Iraq, uh, and also U.S. counterinsurgency tactics, this ended up defeating al-Qaeda in Iraq at the time. Uh, their brand went from being sky high to suddenly the entire al-Qaeda organization wondering what could they do to undo the damage that had been done 
by their losses in Iraq. This was a brand reversal because what had once been a symbol of strength, their brutality, was reversed into a symbol of having overplayed their hands and turning the population against them. Now, with respect to ISIS, it's experiencing a trajectory of losses. Um, it's been in a somewhat decline phase uh, since October of last year. Uh, it's lost territory rather than gaining it. And as a result, they've started to emphasize other ways in which they're strong. One particular way has been their expansion into Africa, which very clearly is at the center of their current strategy. At times, they've uh, exaggerated their gains, and they've gotten the media to report on this. I think the best example is their claim to, have to control the city of Derna in northern Libya. This is not true. It has never been true. But they've gotten the media to report it through multiple outlets, including BBC and CNN. Uh, the reason why is they were able to show a photo of an Islamic State flag on a government building in Derna, and they were able to also show a video of a parade through Derna with Islamic State supporters. Now, this is a city that's controlled by multiple factions, so the fact that they could have a show of force or a flag on a government building is not determinative. It does not mean that they control the city, but this was reported. And you have this uh, cycle in which the Islamic State pushes out its message. Its message goes to the media, and it goes to its supporters. And unfortunately, sometimes the media pushes back the same message to the supporters. So rather than cognitive dissonance and them having to convince themselves that the Islamic State's message is true and the objective media is wrong, instead both are reporting on these exaggerations. And they're able to do this in areas where social media's penetration is low. So it seems that the facts they're putting forward are the only relevant facts. Now, what can the United States do? How can the United States reverse this messaging of strength? One thing that we have to fundamentally be able to do is to compete at the speed of social media. I mean, you're all in government. You understand uh, that our bureaucratic processes would often be, uh, be hard-pressed to compete at the speed of the Gutenberg Bible, let alone at the speed of social media. Um, we need to debureaucratize the process of competing with them. I think in this particular case, uh, dealing with the Islamic State is very different than dealing with jihadist messaging as a whole, because as I've outlined, it has a particular vulnerability that other jihadist groups don't necessarily have. Uh, but in this case, what would be very effective is a small cell that is able to operate that fuses intelligence analysts, those who are able to see what is the Islamic State's messaging, what are they hoping to gain, and where does it not map with reality, with uh, strategic communications professionals. The U.S. government is not always the best voice. Often the best voice may be to push information out to media, fact sheets, uh, selectively declassifying information, and giving them uh, information where they can serve as the objective voice of this, if you get them reliable information. Um, right now I know from interactions with media that this is often not being done. When I'll point to an exaggeration of the Islamic states, often journalists, whether print or broadcast, are hearing it from me for the first time, as opposed to hearing it from the U.S. government. Uh, given, that, given that media and the battle of perception is so central to what the Islamic State is trying to do, the U.S. government has to be more quick to react and to understand the strength of its messaging and to be able to respond at the same kind of speed, focusing in on the key message of the Islamic State at the same speed at which they can push out their own message. Um, overall, defeating the Islamic State's messaging does not defeat jihadism. But this is an important point for a variety of reasons. Um, and furthermore, I can say, uh, tend on an optimistic note, that I do see some promising signs within government that we're starting to shift towards a paradigm of trying to diffuse the perception of the Islamic State's strength. But it's worth following up uh, to make sure that we're taking the appropriate steps. And there, the Senate, I think, can play a major role. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Gartenstein Ross. Um, you know, we, we may not have that rapid communication response capability of the federal government, but I tell, tell you, I think most elected officials have gone through a campaign, particularly presidential campaigns, uh, have that within the political world, a rapid response. And you know, maybe that'd be a good little piece of legislation we could propose as a rapid response communication team. We can pull them from campaigns. So trust me, we, we've got those capable individuals uh, within, our, within our, our knowledge base. Um, I would like to talk about the, the online process. I'd like to ask a question. So we, ISIS is using social media to connect and to talk. And, and by the way, I would like to enter into the record without uh, objection the, the web pages provided by Mr. Sheikh. Uh, if you haven't read them, read them. It's, it's pretty powerful in terms of the examples of, of how ISIS is using the social media. Um, 
But what's the next step after that? You know, maybe Mr. Berger, whoever's more expert at talking about this. So, so they, they recruit, they talk, they talk online, and then what happens? So there is a, a series of stages that you go through with this. Uh, typically, somebody's exposed to their propaganda that's being broadcast out when they take an interest in this. And this isn't just ISIS. This is how social media works generally. You, you find a subject. You take an interest in it, and when you start following it online, you see that there are other people talking about the same subject, and you start conversing with them. So what we'll typically see is that there will be a period where somebody is, is consuming this stuff in the public, and if somebody is seriously interested and, and willing to take a step further, uh, or consider a step further, they will take it to a private format. So that can be a direct message on Twitter, which can't be read in the open source, uh, or on Facebook. Um, more often, they'll go to an encrypted uh, app, such as WhatsApp or Kick, which allows you to, it's basically text messaging with a, an element of encryption. So again, our, our authorities can follow the open source social media, but the minute those individuals who are really serious about it go offline, we go dark. We, we, we lose our capability of following that, and we, have, we really have no idea. Is that basically correct? Well, you can approach it with, with subpoena and other authorities. So, I mean, it is possible to get if, there if, if we the can open decrypt. source, yes. I mean, that's, that's part of the problem is, yeah. you know, and you know, obviously, you know, Silicon Valley is, is resistant to allowing us to decrypt, and even if they were to allow it, there would be other sites off, off, uh, offshore that will also decrypt. So we are losing our capability of being able to follow this. Yes, I would also just add, though, that I mean, our, our, the ability of government to follow it on social, open social media is often murky. Very limited. Um, people in different agencies have different understandings of what they're legally allowed to do when it comes to monitoring the communications of Americans, even on open social media platforms, and that's somewhere where a government-wide initiative to clarify authorities would be very helpful. It, it wasn't in your testimony, but uh, in, in my prep, apparently you have a publication where your best guess was there were 46,000, I think these are your words, overt ISIS supporter accounts on Twitter, maybe high a number of 90,000. Can, can you describe what, what you're talking about by an overt ISIS supporter account? Sure. That figure was from late last year, so it's much smaller now, uh, significantly smaller. But now, uh, why is that? That's... Because Twitter has started aggressively suspending okay. accounts. Um, so an overt ISIS supporter, for the criteria we used for the paper, was that the person, we, we had a series of steps. So first, if you're just like tweeting ISIS propaganda and I love ISIS all day long, then you're an ISIS supporter. If you're not doing that in an obvious way, then we looked at who you followed and then who followed you and sort of analyzed the network to try and see if there was a clear case. So it was a very conservative approach to, to coding somebody as a supporter. But so, it's fundamentally somebody who's not actively trying to conceal their, their interest in ISIS. So, so Mr. Sheikh, as somebody who is who's trying to prevent uh, young girls, for example, uh, or other people that are making those connections. Where are they going now then? Is there an alternative? Well, they, they will remain in the uh, orbit of their particular networks. Um, you know, what I try to do is engage them openly and directly online. I've seen others try to do that as well. Um, in fact, you're seeing people even on the Al-Qaeda side, strangely, uh, arguing against ISIS types, making theological arguments, which is kind of strange considering they're Al-Qaeda. Um, but uh, they will continue to, to orbit their networks. Um, those that do go off into the WhatsApp and KIK, uh, you know, I don't follow them offline into that, but uh, that is what they do. You know, th there are officials of the U.S. government going into Muslim communities, you know, talking. Uh, and and one, one of the reports we got back, and I was very surprised to hear this, is you know, because of the revelations of Edward Snowden, that there seems to be a perception in America that, the federal government knows all, and, and we have perfect knowledge, and we know exactly who's online. We know exactly who's, who's uh, on these sites and, and is becoming radicalized. Uh, and the, the members of those communities were, were actually very surprised that we had no idea. Uh, can, can you kind of speak to that, Mr. Sheikh, in terms of you know, the, the, the necessity of members of, of different communities to be policing themselves and reporting that? Uh, from DHS, it's if you see, so, see something, say something. Yeah, I think um, you know. I think Hollywood has kind of done this as well. That given the the uh, the idea that uh, the intelligence services are, are omnipresent and, and uh, all knowing, uh, maybe in in some cases that's a good thing uh, that people think that uh, that we we can see everything. 
Um, of course, on the other hand, uh, this is something that the government agencies are trying to, to achieve, uh, get into the communities and give them something by which they can actually convince their own communities outside of law enforcement that, look, these are things that you need to watch for. These are your kids being lured over uh, by these individuals. These are your parents that are going to end up in front of you know, TV cameras uh, as they attend court or whatever it is. These are your mosques that are going to see, you know, press and retaliatory attacks and things like that. So uh, it's, it's an ongoing challenge with uh, the communities. There's a level of mistrust and there's this, you know, there are professional naysayers, uh, community organizations that are uh, trying to obstruct and are very obstructionist in the way, in the way they approach this. Um, but this is a, it's an issue that is continuing, uh, continues to, uh, to play out. My final question really springs from uh, a very uh, interesting article written by Graham Wood in The Atlantic and, and really, uh, I think, amplified by your testimony, uh, the significance of, of the territory held and the caliphate established and how that is driving the process, driving the narrative. Uh, you know, perhaps you'd like to talk to that, speak to that, Mr. Bergen. I think the short answer is that's completely true. Um, you know, without the territory, the claim to be the caliphate, if you don't control population, they control about eight to nine million people. It's the population of Switzerland. If you don't control territory, it's the size of the United Kingdom, roughly. Your claim to be the caliphate disappears, which, which has a, you know, an important strategic implication, which is we need to keep chipping away or demolishing this caliphate. But, but again, what does that... What does that inspire in, in the, the minds of, in the hearts of, of followers? I mean, what, what, what is the call? What, what is required once the caliphate is established? Well, I think the call, uh, and this is where it gets complicated and it goes a little bit to what Mubin was talking about. For some highly observant ultra-fundamentalist Muslims, they may feel, hey, I want to go and just be supportive. That doesn't necessarily mean I want to go and become a fighter for ISIS. And so I think as a... As a, as a as a matter for uh, the law enforcement community and the, the Congress to think about, if somebody is not actually uh, indicted for a potential act of terrorism, but merely for trying to go to Syria, we should be thinking about off-ramps that aren't 15 years in prison. Because right now, the problem that Muslim families have is if they see a son or daughter radicalizing and then they say, well, should we call the FBI? Well, then that, that son or daughter may get 15 years in prison. So I think we should think about Oh, and then in Minneapolis, as you know, sir, there is a, there is a case where something other than a very long-term prison term for a 19-year-old uh, young man is, is now uh, in process. And I think it's a model we should be thinking about uh, going forward. Before I turn it over to the ranking member, anybody else want to respond to that? I think that this also speaks to what Mubin had mentioned, which is the debate between al-Qaeda and ISIS supporters uh, online. The reason why al-Qaeda had never declared a caliphate uh, is because they didn't think that they could create something that would uh, have staying power. So if the caliphate gets chipped away geographically, uh, you'll see um, much more within jihadist circles people attacking the decision to declare the caliphate in the first place, which is one reason why, as I said, they're susceptible to a brand reversal because jihadists themselves would turn on them if they start to lose the territorial advantage. As to your question about what is required, for, some, uh, for, from, for someone who believes that the caliphate has been uh, legitimately declared, uh, if they don't accept the caliphate's authority, then they die in a state of sin. This is actually, also gets to one of the intra-jihadist debates as to whether it's legitimate caliphate. Uh, but for people who support it, as, as was outlined, it can be uh, anything from going over there and living in the caliphate, and that certainly is a pull, to for those who aren't able to do so or those who are more well-situated to carry out attacks, uh, doing so at the home front. That's also one reason they've been so successful compared to other organizations in having a prompt to action. Uh, they have a lot of things going for them right now that make them um, acting essentially from a position of strength and within their very small target audience uh, from a position of religious legitimacy. So, so one of the goals of U.S. policy should be to deny, deny them that territory, deny them that caliphate. Uh, I, I think so, yes. And also to make sure that those losses are being broadcast because it has a magnifying effect uh, being broadcast from multiple actors, including civil society activists. Essentially, as we... Uh, improve our communications capabilities, one thing it does is it allows those who are opposed to ISIS to have a, a better vehicle uh, to attack ISIS with. Thank you. I apologize to the, the committee members for going over time. I thought that was important. Uh, Senator Carper. Uh, again, thank you. Uh, thank you all for your testimony and for your responses to, uh, to, our, to our questions. Mr. Berger, I think you used the, uh, the, uh, the word murky 
uh, in your uh, in your comments to uh, to describe the um, I think the authority that with which our officials have to uh, to do certain actions. Go back and just mention this again. Just revisit this for a moment. Well, fundamentally. Uh I don't think there's a consensus in government that we can, you can do large scale monitoring of social media, open social media, of American citizens without a probable cause to investigate. So the role that we see of social media in a lot of cases, we have seen some plots and, and people intending to travel who are detected on social media. More often what we see is social media provides an evidence trail to go after an arrest after you've identified a suspect. Um, you know, fundamentally, for instance, there are questions about how we collect and archive this data and who we collect and archive on it. Do we need to have a reason to go after it or can we sweep up thousands and thousands of accounts? In the case uh, of Garland, for instance, if we had been sweeping up those accounts, we would have a much clearer idea, idea of the track of radicalization for the suspect in open source. Uh, you can go after the stuff with, with subpoenas. You can, you can try and retrieve the data in various ways. But when Twitter suspends an account and when other platforms submit an account, that, that information is no longer available. So this user had previous accounts, seven previous accounts, and we don't have that available to us in the open source to, to talk about that. And I don't know if law enforcement has that available, if they've been archiving it, uh, if they have access to it via subpoena, I'm not entirely sure. Twitter saves the data. I'm pretty sure they do, but I'm not entirely sure. Uh, so these are, you know, kind of questions. I don't. I think the appetite in the country probably isn't very friendly to the idea that the FBI should be vacuuming up thousands and thousands and thousands of social media accounts. So this is, these are the kinds of things I think that are that are in play. And then when you go from agency to agency, there's, there's different kinds of boundary issues that we've run into over the course of some years. I mean, uh, several years ago, uh, there were issues in terms of like the military investigating Americans who were, who were in Al Qaeda in Pakistan and Afghanistan. Uh, you know, military intelligence sometimes had to take names out of, of documents because this, the privileges that we afford American citizens in different contexts are, are sometimes not totally clear how you reconcile that with a pragmatic approach. Okay, thank you. Um, a related question, is, is it more, and this would really be for, um, for I think for uh, Mr. Gardenstein, right, Ross, and again for, for Mr. Berg, is it more advantageous, do you think, for us to work uh, with us and our government to work with companies to shut down social media accounts uh, that promote ISIS or like-minded messaging or to keep those accounts open for intelligence purposes. Mr. Gardenstein Ross. Well, um, JM has actually done some very good work on the disruption. JM Berger? Yeah, J JM here, JM Berger, has done some very good work on showing the disruptive impact that it has. You know, there's a very big debate amongst analysts as to whether you shut these accounts down because on the one hand, you have their ability to radicalize people to action. On the other hand, um, you have the ability to gather information on them. I think increasingly that debate is actually becoming settled because we can see with ISIS the massive impact that these accounts have had. I mean, the, the amount of, of people who've been drawn to the Syria-Iraq theater uh, is greater already than it was uh, during the Afghan-Soviet war in terms of the number of foreign fighters who have come. Social media plays a very big part in that. So I think in general it is advantageous to shut these accounts down um, and this is something that should absolutely be a company's decision. The U.S. government has no authority to do that with one exception which is that if jihadists get frustrated with having their accounts suspended on Twitter, Facebook, etc., they may create their own website their own version of Twitter or Facebook, at which point our uh, superiority in terms of uh, technological capabilities plays a role. That's the kind of site that we could shut down wholesale, um, I think, without any sort of uh, free speech or constitutional problems. Thank you. Mr. Berger, again, very briefly on this, on this question. I have one more. I, I do think there's utility in, in shutting them down. I mean, the, the, intelligence op the intelligence argument is important. But ultimately, the goal of intelligence is to stop terrorists from doing whatever they want to us. And so, you know, you take that into the context of an attack. Obviously, you get a lot of intelligence if a terrorist successfully carries out an attack. Uh, you know, in the same way, in a lower scale, I think that, you know, we, we, we shouldn't give them carte blanche to do whatever they want because it allows us to make nice charts and spreadsheets. Okay, thanks. And this would be a, qu a question for, uh, for all of our panelists. I, I like to focus, as my colleagues know, on root causes, not just on sim addressing symptoms or problems, but addressing the underlying root causes. Uh, what are the root causes 
or underlying causes that compel Americans to engage in violence in the name of jihad? And what common factors, if any, do these individuals uh, share? Mr. Bergen. Yeah, it's a tough one. I mean, I, I've looked at hundreds of cases of Americans who've been sort of drawn to jihadi activity, and, you know, there, there is no ethnic profile. There is no, you know, some of these people are, on average, they tend to be slightly better educated than most Americans. Uh, they, they tend to uh, not, you know, but then on the other hand, you have people from criminal backgrounds. It's, it's, it's very hard to make uh, a one-size-fits-all description. Um, you know, in another era, in the 1970s, perhaps these people might have been drawn to the Weather Underground or the Black Panthers or some other revolutionary utopian movement that promised to remake society through violence. And we've seen that throughout history. Um, uh, but there is, there is no really good answer to that question. It's, like, it, it's a form of the question of what draws people to crime. The answer is too complicated to say uh, in a very you know, uh, quick and, and, and okay. soundbite -y, sound y kind of way. All right, thank you. Mr. Berger? I, I would agree with that. Uh, I think what we see is there are clusters of, of causality. So you can see, for instance, in the Al Shabaab's recruiting in Minnesota, you can you can sort of quantify why that happened, why there were so many from Minnesota. You can look at towns, uh, for instance, Derna, uh, where an organization has a long history that you know, gives you some insight into why that group of people goes. But when you look to sort of generalize, uh, it's, it's very difficult. Um, you know, who you know is probably the most important thing, and that's where the social media comes in. If you can know somebody in ISIS mm -hmm. very easily online, then that presents a greater risk. Thank you. Ruben Sheikh, and then uh, Mr. Gardenstein Ross, and I'll yield my time. Thanks. Of course, the, uh, I share the same caveats of the complexity, uh, but I will give a soundbite version. Uh, without grievances, ideology doesn't resonate, and without ideology, grievances are not acted on. I think the intersect between ideology and grievances uh, do play a significant role in this. All right, thank you. I, I think we've been articulated very well, and uh, let me focus on one thing related to this question, which is what can the U.S. do? Uh, I think we're in That's a world, always a good question. We're in the world right now where ideas catch on much faster, whether they're good ideas or bad ideas. It's easier to achieve a critical mass, and that can play off of, um, you know, as Mubin says, you know, grievances and ideology can intersect together. The question is, what are we doing to ameliorate grievances? And to some extent, that's hard, right? They're, they're, we live in a world that doesn't have perfect justice at all. And we live in a world of finite resources, and we live in a world of competition. Uh, but if you look at what companies are doing, uh, that is corporations in the United States, those who are prospering are increasingly transparent in terms of their decision making, uh, in terms of what they're doing. Uh, the companies that are much more legacy industry type companies and floundering are less transparent, much more top heavy. In many ways, the U.S. government looks like a legacy industry. I think one thing we need to be able to do, and there are many representatives who are good at this, um, is be much more transparent in terms of the U.S.'s decision making. There's a lot of hard choices to make. Uh, you know, J.M. Berger outlined before the, the hard decision in terms of monitoring Americans' use of social media. On the one hand, we understand that people who are on Twitter and radicalizing can pose a danger, but on the other hand, when we think of the FBI sweeping up thousands and thousands of accounts and archiving them forever, that in many ways feels like um, you know, 1984 by George Orwell. So thinking these through publicly, explaining decisions, explaining what we're doing, I think can also help to diffuse part of, of that grievance because moving forward, uh, we're in a world where grievances, whether real or imagined, uh, can catch on very quickly. And the U.S. should think of what it can do in this evolving structure of communication to minimize the U.S. being a target. Good. Thank you all. Thanks, Senator Carper. By the way, I was handed a note that our vote that was scheduled 1030 has been moved to two, so uh, we won't have any interruptions. Uh, Senator Sass. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all of you for being here. Um, after reading your testimony, my main line of questioning was going to be about how you create strategic brand damage to ISIL and to future jihadi groups. But before we go there, I'd like to have a detour and uh, follow Dr. Uh, Gartenstein Ross, your comments about the interplay between traditional and social media. And obviously, the, the media cycles of people wanting to make news today uh, on social media to be picked up by producers on traditional media. Could you unpack a little bit more your Derna comments, please? Yes, absolutely. Uh, Derna was a case in which you didn't have much social media penetration. So right away, uh, when you look at what's being broadcast out of Derna, ISIS essentially started out with information dominance. That's because uh, reporters really couldn't get into Derna to fact check. 
We actually have had um, two different sets of reporters who ventured into Derna late last year. Both of these sets of reporters, uh, Tunisians and Libyans, uh, have gotten executed within the past couple of weeks. Not a, not a good place to do fact checking. And so um, when they have this information about what's happening and they're pushing it out and others aren't pushing it out on social media, the way the news cycle works now, here's information and um, there's no competing information, and maybe you'll check with a few sources, um, but media moves much quicker than it did. It has much less fact-checking, and so it's easier to get a, an invented fact out there and then to have it widely repeated, which I think is exactly what happened in Derna. Dr. Bergen, I don't, this is not to put you on the spot because I don't know how CNN covered the issue, but could you walk us through how decisions in a circumstance like that are made? You know, I'm not familiar enough with CNN's reporting on that. I mean, you know, as a general uh, matter, CNN has, you know, got a very uh, careful fact-checking process. That you don't know if you all reported that ISIS had taken Derna? Yeah, I, I'm not here to comment on CNN's reporting on that. Okay. Um, Dr. Garten Steen Ross, sorry. Uh, one of the things that's unique about ISIL versus al-Qaeda in Iraq previously is obviously a more decentralized network structure as opposed to a more top-down structure. Um, obviously, that creates unique opportunities for them to capture entrepreneurial activity on social media. At the same time, it seems harder for them to control their brand. So it, they have a, a deficit in terms of trying to have a territorial claim with the caliphate, but to the degree that they have a more decentralized structure and can exploit social media over time, do you think that means that their brand becomes diffuse? Um, or if they can suffer losses because they'll eventually suffer territorial losses, what does that do with to their larger social media strategy? So I'd conceptualize them as having both a centralized and also decentralized structure. Uh, on the one hand, they have a bureaucratic system, they have systems of governance, they have official accounts. Then you have the vast uh, number of people who are fighters who are tweeting from the battlefield. And they, they have put directives in place, it's actually very clear, uh, to try to rein some of these guys in. But at the end of the day, when you have you know, a large number of people who are on Twitter, it's difficult to fully control your message. That's something that the U.S. military also grapples with as well. And just like ISIS, we have directives, although uh, we have a better, uh, we have an easier job of uh, reining our guys in, obviously. Uh, with respect to ISIS's brand, I mean, I think that it has a trajectory of its brand overall that's being affected by people at multiple layers, those who are at the central of its communications apparatus and those who are on the fringes. And so the answer is yes, it absolutely has more difficulty controlling its brand. And especially because um, I, 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 re I referenced before the uh, statement by al-Jabadi, uh, the supporter of ISIS who is trying to say, okay, don't broadcast the enemy's atrocities, don't broadcast how hard life is in cities that are under siege, only broadcast strength. That's actually, you know, if you look at my argument, that theirs is a winner's message, that's a very hard message to enforce when that's not actually what's going on because you don't just have ISIS fighters, you also have people who are living in these cities and you can see that some resistance movements have sprung up. They're gonna have a hard time uh, keeping uh, their message the same. Just like we have trouble controlling them on social media, they're increasingly, as they're entrenched as a governing force and a failing governing force, they're having the same trouble suddenly they're the counterinsurgents and they're experiencing something like insurgent activity. Now, I don't want to overstate the dissension within the ranks, but you clearly have it. And they've had this for a while. It's just that it's increasing now. Mr. Sheikh, I'd be interested in your thoughts on that question. Thank you, sir. Um, yeah, of course, I agree uh, yeah, very much, of course, with, uh, with what David was saying. I think... Um, uh, we, we need to uh, continue to amplify the, the mistakes they make, the weakness in the ranks, the dissension in the ranks, uh, especially when it comes to educating uh, potential uh, recruits, uh, individuals, teenagers who may want to travel. Uh, in the beginning, when a lot of this began, uh, there was a concept called Five Star Jihad, uh, where they were putting out, you know, they, they had taken over some guy's villa, and they were swimming in a nice pool in the back, and they were saying, hey, come on down. And uh, for a while, I... I actually took a lot of screen grabs of, of food pictures that they had posted. We had Swedish gummy bears from Swedish jihadis. We had guys posting kebabs, yeah, we got that. Or uh, a mango milkshake and saying, how could I not take a picture of that? Or, you know, the, 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 uh, 
the epitome of an identity crisis where you have a Pakistani uh, ethnicity, UK resident living in Syria referring to pizza as home-cooked food. Um, so I think to, to educate people uh, just by using their own mistakes, their own failings, uh, this is another way that in which we can achieve our objective. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Senator Sass. Uh, Senator Peters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you to the panelists uh, for your testimony uh, today. Uh, I want to explore a, a little bit more in depth about uh, some of the, uh, the counter messaging that we need to do, particularly with uh, the broader Muslim community here uh, in the United States. And I think it's important to remember when we're talking about folks who are engaged in, in these activities uh, with extremism, it's just a tiny, tiny sliver of the uh, Muslim community uh, here in the United States. I have a very large uh, Middle Eastern population in Michigan, one of the largest Middle Eastern populations outside the Middle East, as you know, uh, in my community. And it certainly is um, uh, an opportunity for us to harness uh, the, that community, which is uh, strongly opposed uh, to ISIS and other extremist groups. In fact, uh, there are regular protests against uh, the activities of ISIS as a perversion of Islam and not reflective of the broader uh, Muslim community. Uh, folks want to uh, be engaged uh, in that counter-messaging, which I think ultimately is the way you try to delegitimize uh, the ideology uh, associated with it. I know the White House has made this type of outreach a priority with their empower local partners to prevent violence extremism uh, efforts. Um, it was also a part of the summit uh, on countering uh, violent extremism uh, this year with the White House summit. But a 2013 RAND Corporation report highlights challenges to countering violent extremism online including alienation and lack of trust in the U.S. approach to counterterrorism among American Muslims, as well as the over-securitized approach to government engagement with the Muslim community. Uh, I've heard from some of my constituents who are concerned about pushing back sometimes against this violent extremism and these lies online because they think it might draw some undue attention to them personally uh, as they engage, even though these are anti uh, of messaging that they are doing. Some of them have also experienced racial profiling, other activities at airports because of their Muslim heritage, uh, and so have certainly uh, uh, some level of uh, distrust when it comes to the law enforcement activities, and yet this is an incredible opportunity for us uh, to use patriotic Americans, Muslim uh, Americans who, who live here in our country. If uh, the panelists could address a little bit, how can we uh, engage uh, this community? What would you suggest? Uh, what are the messages uh, that will be important? Um, perhaps, Mr. Sheikh, I know you uh, have dealt with this. We can start with you, but others who would like to, to weigh in, I'd certainly like to have other comments as well. Oh, thank you very much. Um, so I, I was also, I'm actually doing my PhD in psychology, and I'm, I'm looking at uh, community interveners um, and, and what works in intervention programs. And uh, there is this, uh, I call them professional obstructionists, uh, community organizations uh, who, I mean, they are hyper-defensive, uh, they, they really mistrust the government and um, have portrayed any kind of even meaningful, sincere uh, interactions between law enforcement and the community as just an excuse to intelligence gather. Uh, so given that level of mistrust, how, how can we do it? And I think there is a way to do it. Uh, first and foremost, um, the Muslim community understands, and as, as you've uh, observed, the Muslim community doesn't want anything to do with ISIS. And, and uh, really, if you look at the tens of millions of Muslims that are living in Europe, uh, North America in total, you know, we have a maximum amount of 5,000 Western foreign fighters. That is a very, very small number of people. Um, so I think first and foremost, the Muslim community needs to uh, understand that uh, it affects us first and foremost, I think. I mean, ISIS kills more Muslims than non-Muslims. And when they do what they do, it's the Muslim community that feels the retaliation, the discrimination, the marginalization. Uh, so it's a responsibility on behalf of, of I think it's, a, it's on behalf of the religion. I mean, they, I mean we have a duty to speak up and, and give the correct understanding of the religion, lead by example. Um, and there is a way to still work with law enforcement, but at the same time, keep them arm's length, and that is, um, uh, to use uh, programming that is developed in-house, in the communities, uh, where the law enforcement agencies understand what the communities are using so that they can back off and say, yeah, we understand that they have this, you know, uh, identifying vulnerable persons guide, let's say, and we understand that they have a mechanism in place where they can give rehabilitative programming without it necessarily being a top-down approach. And just lastly, I think, uh, I mean, of course, uh, I mean, people have their views, uh, you know, free speech, of course. 
But uh, we have to be very careful not to, to perpetuate uh, the ISIS ideology, which is Islam is to blame. Uh, because if we do that, and if we say that, yeah, you know, Muslims are terrorists, uh, and Islam is all about terrorism, that is exactly what ISIS says. And in fact, I've seen that you have people who are very anti-Muslim, they even use the exact same verses of the Quran that ISIS uses. And if you didn't see the name, you, could, you would swear that it was an ISIS account doing the promoting. Um, so I think there are multiple layers to this, and uh, it, it can be done, but it needs solid direction, I think, and uh, community uh, leadership. Yeah, and direction from within the community. Within that, the community, uh, That it's absolutely. an organic process. Yes. Uh, but also in, the, in that process, uh, law enforcement here in the United States understand that to let the community lead and back it up and to back off, if I'm... Yeah, the, the, uh, just the closing point on this, local police, I think, are best suited for this because it's, uh, the local police are the ones who respond if somebody throws a rock through the mosque or if there's a, a crime that happens in the community. They're not seen as investigating terrorism like the FBI might be. Uh, the, the FBI will have big problems in, in dealing with them at that level. So there is a way to develop those relationships and it needs to be done. Right, thank you. Anybody else want to add to that? We'll just give a couple of specific examples about some of the things Movement's talking about. We can't take down all bad speech, even though that's uh, desirable, but we can also help reinforce better speech. So two examples, Rabia Chowdhury is a Maryland-based uh, American, uh, Muslim-American lawyer who goes around the country training Muslim-American leaders and imams, many of whom don't really understand how the internet works, about how to use it themselves, you know, Google rankings and these kinds of things. Uh, so that's one very concrete thing, because it's very hard to measure countering violent extremism. It, it, you know, the, the success is when nothing happens. So, uh, you know, the, the, but this, I think, is an example of something that is concrete and, and, and working. Another is uh, a woman called Nadia Awaydad, who's a DPhil from Oxford, who is aggregating all satirical con content about ISIS in Arabic online, uh, because, of course, satire is a very powerful weapon against this kind of group. And finally, for the U.S. government, the U.S. government can't engage in any kind of theological debate for all sorts of obvious reasons. But the message we, that U.S. government officials should constantly say is this group def positions itself as the defender of Islam, but its uh, victims are overwhelmingly Muslim. It's a factually correct statement that requires no knowledge, special knowledge of, uh, of Islam. And I think it's a powerfully undercutting message for what this group is trying to say about themselves to the Muslim world. Thank you. I think I'm out of time. Thank you, Senator Peters. Uh, Senator Booker. I want to jump right in. I have to say, in preparing for this hearing, I was uh, surprised, if not stunned, uh, at how we're approaching uh, our messaging and our counter-messaging, frankly. Um, I find it clearly that there are about 2.9 million Muslims living in the United States, and half of them are under 30. We're talking about a very young population. Now, I agree with Senator Peters, the overwhelming 99 point whatever percent are good young people that reflect uh, the rest of the population, but we're dealing with a population of young people that are online and engaged in an extraordinary manner. And in the Middle East, you have even a greater percentage of people that are under 30 years old. And the new form of communication is social media. 90% of Americans age 18 to 29 use social media. Uh, 9 in 10 18 to 29 year olds watch online video and almost half of them, that's where they get their news. And uh, I know a little bit about social media, I have to say, and when I started going around to the sites that we have uh, in our various uh, agencies, DHS, uh, 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 National Counterterrorism, State Department, uh, I was shocked at what we're doing in counter messaging. I want to pass this iPad around to my, uh, to, my, uh, to my colleagues. And two things to take note of, there are two tabs at the top and you could toggle between. One is just a YouTube video, and we up this hundreds of hours going on up every minute on YouTube. And the videos that they're doing are incredibly slick, fancy, uh, and uh, attractive. You're a bunch of uh, extremist terrorists giving out things to kids and sharing the like. If you toggle back over to the United States, and what we're doing, here is the Think and Turn Away uh, website by the Department of State. If you look, if you know anything about social media, the one of the things you should look at is the engagement of uh, people on our social media feeds, and it's laughable. Uh, uh, three retweets, two retweets. Now, if you think about this, uh, last year, or at least fiscal year, 2000, fiscal year 13, and you can pass this down to my colleagues, we spent $196 million on Voice of America. This is old school media. It's radio and the like. 
And and I well, maybe Mr. Maybe Mr. Ger, Gerstein Ross, maybe you know how much money did, are we are we investing and in appropriating for social media counter messaging? Uh, they, they don't specifically uh, budget out social media separately, but it's clear that it's, it's a small percentage of, of what's being done. And further, as you point out, um, you know, a lot of times what, what we push out via social media um, is very crude. I mean, crude is a, is a generous statement. <laughs> uh, um, you know, you said a wonderful phrase. You said we need to compete at the speed of social media. Mr. Bergen, you said in your written testimony that the one thing that uh, unifies these folks is that they're age and that they're online. And you would think that if, if this is one of the threats, when we've asked counterterrorism people here from the United States, what's their biggest concern is domestic lone wolf uh, individuals, that this is where the majority of them are, uh, uh, are getting uh, radicalized, which is online in social media. And if we have an inadequate uh, uh, response to that, it, it's, it's, it's very frustrating. Now, uh, if I could, Mr. Mr. Uh, um, uh, Sheikh, am I pronouncing that right? Uh, sir, your, your, your work is incredible. I see you online trying to push back on this. There are easy tactics. I know them, as you said, from politics, how to get more voice and virality to messaging that we're not using as a government uh, to get counter messages out there. You have... You know, I know something about memes, the data that you're presenting about Muslims killing Muslims, and this is a group that's killing more Muslims, to get memes to go more viral. Look at their fancy memes compared to what we're not doing. And so I, I just want to start with Mr. Bo uh, Mr. Sheikh. I mean, you're trying, it looks like to me that you're trying to do uh, counter messaging, uh, but we have a government that's spending millions and millions of dollars on old school forms of media, and as you said, Mr. Gerstein Ross, very crude uh, uh, social media efforts. Um, what could, what do you imagine could be done if we were going to do an effective social media online counter messaging effort? Uh, thank you very much. Um, you know, in uh, in some kind of defense to the uh, Center for Strategic Counterterrorism Communications, uh, they have a very small group of people. They're trying to contest the space. Uh, and and they're they're trying to do something, and I and I get that. And and yes, crude is a is a very polite statement. Um, look, at the end of the day, if you want to fight back against uh, recruitment of 15-year-old kids, you need to work with 15-year-old kids. Um, when I see my own kids uh, showing examples of what affects them and what motivates them and what resonates with them, it tells me that this is exactly what you need to do. Uh, talk to the kids. They, they can do a really good job. Uh, with respect to producing material, um, you, know, you know, one of the comments that I said was, I mean, really, I, I feel that it is unacceptable, uh, especially given, I mean, you have Hollywood in the U.S. I mean, you have people who, you don't even need to go at that level. I mean, maybe this is something that should be done to go at that level. I mean, to blow the production capabilities out of the water. Um, but even college levels, high school kids to be given projects for them to do, um, you know, just as part of a, a school project, as part of a civic engagement process, um, even Muslim organizations. I mean, maybe you have NGOs who could fund um, pro, uh, uh, projects within the community to come up with these sorts of things. Uh, the government is really um, not well placed other than uh, if you were to take it to the covert level of psychological operations and then you do have individuals who, who, who know influence activities, uh, who know to generate stuff which, which they can deploy but in a more covert manner. So again, multiple layers, uh, there is a way to do it but and, and, and Mr. Bergen, I have very little time left, but when I was mayor of Newark, we saw that the mentions of our city were incredibly negative, and we set out on social media and used a simple sentiment analysis to see that engagement in social media began to change the brand of our city. Uh, um, and I'm just wondering, you talk a little bit in your testimony about crowding out uh, the negative messages, and I've seen people do this in many different forms. There's lots of different strategies. H how do you characterize what we are doing to crowd out the negative messages, to arm uh, many of the people within the American Muslim community and others to, uh, to sort of compete within this space to begin to push other messages? How would you describe our, our attempts? And is there a better way to centralize and coordinate across numerous agencies a, a better push for the United States? Uh nascent is how I characterize what we're doing. I mean, NCTC has uh, been doing some of this work and trying to work with some of the uh, tech companies and the Muslim American community. But, you know, there's a kiss of death problem with the U.S. government being involved. So it has to be hands off. Um, and it is beginning. Uh, we don't want to, it's not all doom and gloom. Uh, there are people out there doing the kind of work that's, ne that's necessary, sir.
Okay. Chairman, thank you very much. Thanks, Senator Booker. There's an obvious piece of legislation that we need to start working on. I've already directed the staff, but let's face it, we invented the Internet. We invented these social network sites. We've got Hollywood. We've, we've got the capabilities, as, as Mr. Sheikh was saying, to blow these guys out of the water from the standpoint of uh, communication. So we need to work on that. We need to work on that quickly. So I hope you'll engage in that effort. Uh, Senator Ayotte. I want to thank the chairman and appreciate Senator Booker's comments as well. And it strikes me, though, um, in hearing your answers, it makes sense that this isn't going to just be a government function because uh, government isn't particularly well at some of these uh, updated use of technology. And so I think engaging the private sector, engaging um, you know, NGOs and others to help us do that, and we can provide you know, the support for that, but, but I think that would be great to establish those partnerships to be able to make that happen. Uh, I was very interested in, in reading um, in your testimony, especially Mr. Bergen, about women, um, that there seems to be an attraction uh, for young women um, that they're recruiting uh, with, with more than, I think, a historical basis. Uh, to ISIS, and um, can you talk to me about that? And it seems to me that as I look at some of these uses on social media, they almost romanticize uh, what is happening over in Iraq and Syria and what these women who might, uh, might want to either join or, I guess, uh, connect themselves uh, in the U.S. Or, or in some other Western country with ISIS. And um, so it strikes me that the more we can get the truth out also, whether it's embedding reporters or what's really the conditions are. I know it's very dangerous, so that's challenging. But however we can get the truth out about what's really happening on the ground in the caliphate, that this isn't some kind of romantic uh, endeavor that you're probably traveling to or, or asking to engage in. So I wanted to get thoughts on how we address this with women. Well, that's right, Senator. So 20% of the sample we looked at from the United States are women and about 10% overall from the West are women, which is unprecedented. So, and why are they going there? You know, they've been told it's a perfect society. They may well meet their perfect marriage partner. A lot of these are very young. The average age is 19. So, uh, but how do we contest that? I think you're exactly right. Uh, people like Mubin Sheikh and who's, you know, disillusioned former militants who can actually speak the truth about what's happening and amplifying their voices, that's by far the most effective thing we can do. Uh, so it's finding those people, and there are already people coming back. Who, we saw this in the Minnesota case, uh, Senator Johnson, when people started saying, well, wait a minute, Shabab is not the promised land. And, and they, so, it, but it took two or three years for the message, and you know, J.M. Berger, I'm sure, can uh, amplify on this. But so it's going to take. It, but we're at the point where there are enough bad stories coming out. I think that uh, that's a reasonable kind of idea, which is amplifying the voices of disillusioned uh, mil militants. Yeah, I think it, when we're we're looking at trying to undermine ISIS's messaging, one problem we have is that the the information we have that does undermine their projection of strength of this utopian society is mostly eyewitness testimony from defectors. And that's not as compelling as photographs, video, and audio. And so, you know, one of the things that I've proposed is that in as much as we can deploy intelligence assets to get pictures of what's going on in, the, in these areas, to intercepted communications, things that have much, are much more gripping and much more compelling instead of just one person's story, which is easy for a radical to dismiss because a radical is already convinced that they have the right idea anyway. If, if I could jump in, there is a, I mean, on the flip side of this, there's a wonderful site called uh, Silently Slaughtering Raqqa, which is a t you know, Twitter feed of what's really going on in Raqqa. There are pictures of bread lines. They're, they're, they're saying, right. hey, the electricity is only on for three hours a day. So the point is that there is an alternative uh, universe on social media that's portraying what's really happening that exists and we should understand and, and know about. Absolutely, and we should promote it and yeah. encourage people to see what really is happening. Uh, because I think there is sort of a romanticized view being pushed out there that's attractive to people. Um, I wanted to get your thoughts, all of you, on um, the leader of ISIS, uh, al-Baghdadi. And he seems to have, using social media, using uh, information to put out a certain image of himself uh, that is not line up with the truth. And so how do we, what's your thought on, on the leader now? I understand we take out a leader and another leader can follow, but he seems to have um, portrayed himself in a certain way. And what thoughts do you have for us to try to undermine the leadership uh, of, to show that they're not really who they purport to be? 
So I think uh, Baghdadi is kind of an interesting figure in this context. He's in some ways he's kind of an empty suit or a Rorschach test. Uh, he has a basic biography which is carefully calculated to support the legitimacy of naming him Caliph. Uh, we know a little bit more about him through independent reporting, but the image that he projects is really uh, somebody who appears rarely, who speaks in jihadist platitudes, and as such he is somewhat replaceable. You can bring your expectations to who he is and and understand him in the context that you want. He doesn't have the same powerful cult of personality that somebody like Osama bin Laden did. Mm. Um, he, he is replaceable, uh, you know, and I would assume that ISIS has a plan for succession because they do have to meet certain criteria to, to replace a caliph. It's not like Al-Qaeda where you can just give the guy who has the most seniority the job. Uh, and he may be an important strategic thinker in the group. I mean, there's some reason to think that. So replacing him may undercut their ability to operate, but it may not. I think we touched on this earlier, but how important in all this context is it that we, thinking about what ISIS is doing actually on the ground and trying to establish this caliphate in uh, Iraq and Syria, I serve on the Armed Services Committee as well, uh, that we continue to you know, work with our partners there to actually diminish their capacity. Because I think I heard one of you say that, that the fact that they control territory gives them a greater ability to recruit because it shows their legitimacy. And the more we can, so it's almost like we have to be addressing this on all fronts, it seems. I think the short answer is yes to that. One, one element of this that I would just bring up, because we've talked a lot about how uh, their loss of territory would undermine their recruiting, and it would, but ISIS is also an apocalyptic millenarian group, and traditionally what happens with groups like this is when the prophecies that they are fulfilling turn out not to be correct, they will often double down on violence. Mm -hmm. So ISIS could lose its territory, we could undercut its recruiting, but we could see very disastrous uh, secondary effects to that. We've seen that with Al Qaeda. Uh, we've well. seen it with Al Shabaab. I would and, say, is, yeah. is, and Al Shabaab doesn't have the same platform of prophecy that that uh, ISIS has built itself on. So, yeah. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Hayat. Uh, Senator Portman. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for having the hearing. Uh, and this has been fascinating. I really appreciate the experts coming and talking to us about this. Let me just give you a interesting. Uh, a case study from Ohio, you know, um, the, the middle of the country. Um, like every other state here, you know, we're concerned about radicalization. And um, there are recently two cases. One is Christopher Lee Cornell, some of you know, 20-year-old, Cincinnati, Ohio, my hometown, wanted to come here and, and bomb the Capitol. Um, that happened earlier this year. He's now under arrest. Um, just last month, um, Abdurman Sheikh Mohammed of Columbus was indicted on federal charges. He actually became the first American, as I understand it, accused of training in Syria and then returning to try to conduct a terrorist attack here in the United States. So one is um, um, a classic lone wolf, right? So he's um, on the internet, gets radicalized, um, a loner. Um, the second is a member of a community uh, in central Ohio, uh, as I understand it, the Somali community. Um, I know a number of members of that community. Uh, they are very concerned about the radicalization. They are engaged and involved in it. Um, the hard to have a productive dialogue about it. Some of the things you all talked about, they are doing, um, and it's two very, very different challenges. And we've talked more about the community one, and I'd like to hear more about that if you have thoughts. Um, but also about you know the, the lone wolf, and maybe this goes to more what. Uh, Senator Booker was talking about. I looked at your appendices, uh, Mr. Sheikh, and unbelievable, you know, the kinds of stuff that they are doing. And we certainly have the capability uh, to do more with more resources. So I guess my first question would be, um, do you view these as two distinct challenges with two very different uh, strategies and, and just assessing the two strategies? And a sub part of that would be a specific question I've always had. You've got um, three groups, DHS, NCTC and FBI, you know, all working together to try to support particularly these community outreach programs, understanding that, as Mr. Sheikh said, local police are the face of it, but to get these best practices and the expertise, frankly, our local communities are not going to have, have the access to that. Are, are they doing a good job coordinating, uh, or, there should, or should there be one agency that has a more 
responsibility and therefore accountability. And I will open it up. I'd like to hear from all of you. You know, training overseas makes you more dangerous. I mean, we saw in Paris that the fact that one of the perpetrators had trained with Al Qaeda in Yemen made, and made him made it a much more effective attack. So yes, they're very different, and lone wolves have a natural ceiling to what they can do because they're operating alone and they don't have an organization. They usually don't have training. So they are two separate issues. I'm glad you mentioned Senator Portman, uh, uh, Mr. Muhammad from uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, because. He's the only returnee who's come back to the United States who's alleged to have plotted an attack. Crucially, Columbus, Columbus pardon me, sir. Crucially, he's, he was trained by Nusra, which we haven't really talked about today, which is the Al Qaeda affiliate in Syria. So, you know, we, the focus is a lot on ISIS, but we, uh, the, the two cases of Americans coming back to the United States, uh, one of whom didn't plot anything here, one who's alleged to, uh, were both Nusra. So we need to keep that in mind. This is particularly uh, troubling and interesting because it was an al-Shabaab, even though it's understanding it came from the Somali community, and you would have thought it would have been al-Shabaab. Uh, I think in, in that particular case, it was not clear in the court documents exactly who he had trained with. He had started with Nusra, and then he went to an unspecified training camp and talked to unspecified clerics uh, while he was posting about the Islamic State. Um, in, in terms of the problems, these are two different problems. We could see uh, we could see ISIS try and bridge the two to coordinate loosely uh, lone wolf type activity with organized type terrorist activity. Uh, in, in the case of this attorney, you know, uh, there, this may be a dry run to see what happens when you send somebody back. Uh, we have seen that ISIS has had return fighters who, who have been active in Europe. Uh, we've seen at least one case of what was described by investigators as an ISIS operational cell in Belgium. Uh, you know, I, there's not much reason to think that they won't try this kind of thing. Uh, so, you know, we need to sort of keep an eye on this as it develops. The lone wolf piece of it is easy for them. It's easy. It's, it's something they've proven that they're pretty good at relative to other groups. Uh, and it's going to capture a lot of headlines for them without a big investment. So the question is how much they want to invest in attacks here. And, and I think that's pretty unclear right now. We don't have a clear clear beat on that. Mr. Jay, could you talk a little about the coordination between DHS and um, the FBI and uh, uh, the NCTC? Yeah, there is a, uh, there is a, um, a DHS a coordinator on CVE, on countering violence extremism, um, uh, David Gersten, G-E-R-S-T-E-N, um, comes from a civil liberties background, uh, which, which I was pleasantly surprised to see that DHS is putting that kind of uh, resource in that area. Uh, the Office of uh, Civil Rights and Civil Liberties is also looking at uh, how to avoid the, uh, uh, the securitization aspect of it. Uh, the securitization aspect of it is, is really poisonous to the, to the CVE branding, I think, uh, as communities, if they perceive, uh, uh, especially at the behest of what I call these obstructionist community groups who are really giving a false narrative of what the government is trying to do, uh, it, will, it will continue to be a problem. If I could just quickly make a point on the lone wolf. Uh, you know, uh, what kind of lone wolves are we talking about? Uh, I call them ISIS zombies. Uh, these are the self-activating, um, might have mental health issues, uh, really low level of competency. Uh, but then you could have, um, you know, directed attackers uh, who, let's say, are Syria returnees and do have a level of competency where, you know, just one person can, can, uh, can pull off a, a quite effective attack. Uh, in Paris, of course, only two guys uh, did what they did. So. Uh, you could easily have a, a, a cell of, of, you know, six people, um, three two-man teams to go and do simultaneous attacks and, and would, would really cause some, some great disruption. So uh, there are, again, a, a, a number of threats in that spectrum. But just back to the community for a second. You were making the point that we need to do a better job of providing best practices community by community. It will be different. Local face, you said, was important, getting the community engaged and involved. And again, I said the Somali community in Central Ohio has been very involved, and I think in a productive dialogue. Is the federal government, where you know we have responsibility, doing an effective job of coordinating between the, the three agencies I mentioned and perhaps even uh, some other agencies that are more on the intelligence side, is, is that working, or should there be more accountability that comes from more definitive responsibility? It, it, is, it is working. Um, I am positive, uh, I'm optimistic on that side. First and foremost is because uh, there was no coordinator before. Um, and so now that there is a coordinator and that that is happening uh, is a positive step. 
it's running into these issues of, um, of, of critics uh, saying, you know, these are just, this is just an excuse to intelligence gather. Um, but I think DHS and, and their particular mechanisms that are working on CVE uh, are trying to navigate this space uh, as best as possible. Mm -hmm. Mr. Thank Thanks, Senator Portman. We'll start another round. Thank you, Mr. I, I, I started my opening statement with the description of that posting uh, with the claim that there are 71 trained fighters, 23 have accepted assignments. Uh, again, no, nobody knows whether that's bluster or whether it's real. I, I, guess, I will ask the question, is, is that an unprecedented, unprecedented posting? Have we seen similar things like that, similar threats that j simply haven't panned out? Anybody? I, I think we have multiple times. And I'll give you an example. You know, do you remember the blackout on the East Coast? I think it was in 2005. Uh, some jihadi group claimed credit. So, I mean, merely because they say something doesn't mean it's true. What, what, about, what about from ISIS, though? I mean, recently. Or is that, is that kind of unprecedented from ISIS? No, it, it's pretty precedent. Uh, they, the volume of material they put out is just truly extensive, and it comes in a lot of different formats. So they've made a variety of threats with greater, more or less specificity over time. One of the reasons that, you know, that was surprising about the Garland event was that it was something that they had actually specifically talked about that then turned into an attack, and that's pretty unusual because they create so much noise that, that that needle in the haystack can be very difficult to detect. So, so you really take that, that posting with a great deal of skepticism? Yeah. It, I, it's that, it's that, it's the attempt at a winning message? Yeah. I, I think that, you know, certainly they have, you know, dozens to low hundreds of, of passive supporters in this country, and uh, some of those people may be prepared to act, but I don't think there's anything remotely as, as organized as what that post described. Mr. Gardenstein Ross, uh, certainly in your testimony uh, and in both written and oral, uh, you were talking about the, the rise of the brand of ISIS, but they're also very vulnerable to a reversal of that. Um, I, I certainly hope that's true. Uh, I, I also understand strategically that they have made a lot of enemies and they're on, you know, being attacked on a number of different fronts. The state of goal of this administration of America right now is to degrade and ultimately defeat ISIS. I've, I've asked administration officials in the past, what does defeat look like? I mean, define it. Uh, I'd like to have you gentlemen take, take a crack at what, what does, d does defeat look like to you and, and how achievable is that? I'll start with you, Mr. Gardenstein Ross. I, I think there's actually a very clear um, thing that defeat means in this context, which isn't true of other jihadist groups. Uh, they have staked their legitimacy to the caliphate's continuing viability. Uh, and if the caliphate is no longer viable, then they can lose legitimacy pretty quickly. So I, I think that if you're able to make the caliphate no longer a viable entity, no longer perceived as a viable entity, then at that point they have, in effect, lost. Now, their narrative won't be completely dead. If you understand the nuances of their narrative and the end times arguments of it, um, they have certain outs that, for example, they believe that at some point there will be a grand battle and they actually will be crushed. And, but what essentially it means is that you're, you make this already marginal movement much, much more marginal. Uh, and let me actually add one final thing, because this ties into the way we're conceptualizing community and lone wolves. So as we talk about what can the community do to delegitimize the message, the way I'd, I would think of it is what can the community do to continue to delegitimize the message? Because for the United States, if we had a 5% approval rating, we would think that was an awful thing. For ISIS, they can have a 5% approval rating, and that's a great thing for them because they're dealing with, with, with those who are very much on the margins. They're not even dealing with the whole jihadist movement. There are many within the jihadist movement who argue against ISIS. So the question really is how do we, not how do we change an entire community, but how do we stop this fringe group from, get, from spurring people to action? And that's why this legitimacy of the caliphate actually will, in my view, uh, have a disproportionate impact on their ability to remain viable as a movement. Does, does anyone else have a different, different definition of defeat? I, I think that we're best served by strategies that encourage ISIS to fail on its own terms. Uh, in Cutting it off uh, economically, an, an, in, an internal collapse or a, a major schism inside the group I think would be better for us than 
uh, a forcible ejection from their territory, especially if that ejection was done primarily through American military. But, but that, that's the method, the, the defeat. I mean, how it looks like is the denial of that territory the end of the caliphate, correct? Oh, yeah. Well, it's the end of their territory, but it's not the end of the story. I mean, they already have branches and uh, right. robust presence in Nigeria, in Libya, yeah. I mean, an, an important point, I'm glad you pointed that out. Again, any, anybody else have a different definition of defeat? So then my next question is, you know, I'm no military expert and I, I don't think we have one on the panel, no offense. Uh, you, you have expertise that has been very valuable here. Uh, how far away are we from that definition of defeat? As you said, I don't think anyone on this panel can say, but I can point to a few things we should look to. Um, you know, number one, looking to internal resistance movements is very important. I, I agree with JM that, um, at, that with JM Berger that at the end of the day, if the defeat comes from within, um, that's going to be a much more resounding defeat. Now, I should. But, but how possible is that? We we already see resistance movements in some areas. Now, the question is how. Well, there's two 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 things to this. Number one is how robust are they? You know, in the past, we saw very robust resistance movements to AQI, but the U.S. also played a role in helping to ensure that they weren't destroyed. The second thing I should warn is I think a lot of these resistance movements um, are also people we don't like. Like, I mean, you have, on the one hand, probably Ba'athist resistance movements, and I would say almost certainly you have Al-Qaeda resistance movements, which plays into the broader struggle within jihadism. But that being said, um, you know, looking to internal dissent, uh, looking to... Uh, number two, internal squabbles. There was a question before about Baghdadi. And um, while uh, uh, I think that um, Baghdadi uh, is replaceable, um, you know, once you have a succession, especially within an organization like this, which has a cult of personality internally, that might cause some greater fragmentation uh, within ISIS, which could be a good thing in terms of the defeat of ISIS uh, specifically. And the final thing we could look to is, um, you know, given that they're a bit overstretched militarily, uh, you could possibly see you know, rapid reversals, just like when the U.S. engaged in its campaigns early in the Iraq War, in the Afghanistan War, and also even in Libya, there were very rapid reversals of the enemy that was trying to hold territory. It is hard to hold territory, particularly when your population is not particularly happy with what you're doing. I do have a remaining second, so I just have to ask this question. Uh, Mr. Sheikh, uh, talking about engagement with communities, understanding probably local police be all the better, but it's, you know, how do you have a coordinated effort? But you know, how, how do we find more movement shakes? How, how, how do we find more people like you that, that have had a change of heart and that have your capacity and your capability and your willingness to, to really appeal and, and try and turn, turn people away from this? Oh, I wish we could clone me. I mean... Uh... So I think we all do as well. <laughs> um... You know, I, 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 I tried to do the right thing. Um, I got here because I, I believe I did make the right decisions. Um, and it came at a lot of personal cost, I'll be, I'll be honest. And I think a lot of people may not be ready to do that. I think the, uh, you know, the, it, when we say empowerment, I think it needs to be made clear for a lot of these individuals who are back. Uh, and really, the intelligence community knows who these people are. Um, and, you know, well, after they've been vetted and maybe they need to have continual uh, monitoring. Um, but to have them step up, have them step up, go to Muslim conferences, um, let them be seen on media, mainstream media, where people hear the message. Uh, I don't want to be the only person. A lot of times I feel frustrated. I see, you know, I'm the only guy doing it. Everyone's talking about counter-messaging. Nobody's really doing enough of it. Um, but uh, there are others like me out there. They just, uh, they just don't know how to come forward, and, and so they, they will need some direction uh, to do that. Well, I, I think I speak for all of us when I say God bless you for what you're doing. Uh, Senator Carper. I'm Tom Carper, and I approve that message. God bless you. Um, this one for, uh, for all of you, please. And uh, I just want to say, uh, Mr. Sheikh, do you pronounce your name Mubin or Mubin? Yes, you're right, Mubin. Mubin. All right. Uh, okay. uh, have you ever been called Mubin? Yes, I have. And in high school, it was Mubin, and then it became Bin, and then the joke was like Bin, like Bin Laden, and yes. then, then it stopped being funny. So. <laughs> <laughs> we have a Bin, not like Bin Laden, so in our family. Um, uh, several of my colleagues have said that in, uh, in order for the, the, uh, the U.S. to have a success against al-Qaeda and uh, against ISIS, we must... Uh, adequately define the problem and our enemy. 
and they suggest that we should unequivocally uh, announce that the U.S. is at war with Islamic extremism or radical Islam is, uh, in your opinion, in your opinions, is it necessary or beneficial for the U.S. to define ISIS and al-Qaeda in this manner? And uh, ask David, David, go first, please. The question really is, is what is the benefit of doing so? Um, I, I'm not sure that there's a benefit in explicitly uh, emphasizing that we are at war with radical Islam. There's the question embedded in that with what is radical Islam. In, in Libya, for example, one of the problems with uh, one of the warring factions in that civil war, um, th that being the Dignity Faction, uh, is that Khalifa Hifter, who's a very high uh, um, he's their commander-in-chief, uh, defines you know, radical Islam, defines the enemy as including both Islamists who would work in the political process and also jihadist organizations, which makes it, um, you know, if one were to, uh, say, support his organization, uh, would make it a civil war that's much bloodier and much more broadly defined than it should be. Secondly, the administration has moved away from using religious rhetoric. It's tried to avoid terms like Islam, jihad, in its own rhetoric, and I think that that's a reasonable thing to do in terms of public messaging. The area where I, I sometimes disagree um, is that I think that if we as analysts uh, aren't able to process the ideological dimension, we're at a disadvantage. But in terms of public messaging, I don't think it's, advantage, it's advantageous for the U.S. to um, make its, its uh, enemy radical Islam writ large. Thanks. Rubin. Thank you, sir. Um, TICS, T-I-C's, terrorists in Islamic costume. It uses the adjective Islamic in a correct way because I believe Islamic terrorism is an oxymoron. Uh, but because they're appealing to the Islamic sources and not the Bhagavad Gita, I mean, we, we need to see something Islam. So terrorists in Islamic costume. And if I could impose the, the Muslim term for these people, uh, it is khawarij, as I have in the uh, K-H-A-W-A-R-I-J. And I've given scriptural references from the Prophet, peace be upon him, who referred to the khawarij in the most... Um, vile terms. They are the dogs of hell. Um, in fact, we believe in the Islamic tradition that these people subscribe to that uh, the Antichrist himself uh, emerges from the last remnants of the Khawarij. Um, so those are the two terms that I encourage you using. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks. JM. So uh, I do agree with David and, and that we need to understand the religious dimension of this as, as people studying the problem. However, in terms of the public dialogue, and in terms of the, the motivation of this we-must-name-the-enemy kind of motif, uh, you know, the thing that I think about when I think about this is that in 2013 I did a study of white supremacists' use of Twitter and found that the people who were following white supremacists on Twitter talked continually about and primarily about mainstream conservative Republican politics. And we don't insist that neo-Nazis be referred to as conservative radicals or Republican radicals, and I think that there's a double standard. It's easier to insist when it's a minority. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Thanks for, thanks for that. Uh, Mr. Rogan? I totally endorse what's already been said. As a public messaging matter for the U.S. government, it should be very careful about, about using these terms. As an analytical question, certainly this has got something to do with Islam, uh, difficult as that is to uh, maybe uh, say. But uh, those are two different uh, aspects of the problem. All right. As 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 you thank you all for those responses. As as you know, in um, in uh, religion in, in this country, I won't speak about other countries, but uh, in the uh, Protestant faith, we have many flavors. Um, Protestants, we have Methodists, we have Lutherans, we have Baptists, we have Presbyterians, and the list goes on and on and on. And when we uh, think of the Muslim faith, uh, there is not just, as I understand, not just one or two, uh, but uh, but but many. But we oftentimes think of Shia and we think of Sunni. But I realize it's not that simple. But when when you look at the uh, those uh, the uh, what is this, ISIS, Al Qaeda, but you look at the folks that are the jihadists and they're bent on what is the caliphate or just uh, domination. And destruction. Uh, I don't notice as much Shia involvement. Is that my imagination, or, or not? Could you could you speak to that for me, one of you, both of you? Certainly, with respect to ISIS and Al Qaeda, you don't have Shia involvement. Uh, both of them are Sunni movements. Uh, ISIS, in particular, is vehemently anti-Shia. 
Um, Al-Qaeda is quite anti-Shia, although has tried to constrain that a bit. When you think of, of Shia movements, uh, Hezbollah is the primary one that's a, a non-state actor with state sponsorship. Uh, you also have um, Shia movements who uh, you know, are kind of part of uh, our coalition in Iraq, uh, these uh, non-state Shia militias, but they pose their own set of problems. A lot of them are quite radical. If you look at what they're actually doing, uh, they're brutalizing the Sunni population there. And that could create, make this a longer term problem. So yes, in terms of ISIS, Al Qaeda, absolutely. Uh, but I, I certainly uh, wouldn't factor out uh, the importance of some of these uh, Shia militant non-state groups. And uh, one person who's done very good work on this is Philip Smythe at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, releasing a major, a major monograph on this uh, earlier this year, which I think is really essential reading for understanding that particular aspect of this conflict. All right, thanks. Last question, if I could. Uh, Mr. Burger King, could you share with, uh, with us the story of uh, Omar Shafiq Hamami, please? and your experiences with him, please. So Omar Hamami was uh, a Alabama native. He was born in a family to a Syrian father and a Irish Catholic mother. And he became radicalized and joined al-Shabaab. Uh, and where I came into the story was after he joined al-Shabaab, he got there and discovered that things were not to his liking. So uh, foreign fighters were not being treated well. Uh, Al-Shabaab had a, a nasty habit of assassinating Al-Qaeda emissaries who had been sent to try and rein the group in. Uh, there was corruption and, and inconsistencies ideologically. And so he took to the internet and, and put out a video uh, saying, look, I have all these problems with Al-Shabaab and I expressed my opinions and now they're trying to kill me and I need help. And this was, plea was directed to Al-Qaeda Central. He imagined that uh, somebody from Al-Qaeda would come right, riding in to save him, which did not happen. Uh, he, in, in many ways, he was a kind of a vanguard of this, the emergence of this movement on social media, um, and not the only one by any stretch. But prior to about 2012, 2013, jihadist use of social media was much lower. Um, and because of Omar, but also because of other dissenters from uh, the, the lockstep jihadi movement, um, people started getting online. They started coming online to, to argue with Omar. So Al-Shabaab dispatched people to come out and say, this guy is a liar. Uh, and then people popped up to push back on that, and it sort of escalated out from there. And the same thing was happening in Al-Qaeda in Iraq context uh, on the jihadist forums. So uh, I had a, an extended correspondence with Hamami uh, on social media, which was an unusual experience. Uh, some of my comments about the remote intimacy and, and the, sort of the feeling of knowing somebody over social media are informed by that because, uh, you know, in, when you talk to somebody briefly every day uh, or, or every couple of days, you can get a sense of them as a person which may be artificial and inflated in your head, but they become much more real to you uh, than somebody you're reading about or somebody you correspond with by a post so very interesting very interesting hearing I think very informative thank you thank you all thanks Senator Carper Senator Booker again I want to I want to thank the panel so much uh, for being here today and and really even your written testimony uh, was so strong and 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 put my staff to thinking about these issues in, in many layers and I'm grateful for that in the in the final minutes of of, of this hearing uh, I would just like to ask you all if you were a senator, and I know that's a scary prospect, um, but if you all were uh, senators or uh, even in a, a high-level executive position and were looking at the, this issue of uh, counter-communications, uh, uh, we use words like uh, nascent and uh, rudimentary before, but what would the vision we're trying to get to? What, what, if, if you could push for two years and the chairperson said, well, we, this is a, we should make us think about legislation, you know, what specifically would, you know, in terms of strategy and tactics, would you want to see being implemented in a broader scale uh, 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 by 2016, 2017? Anybody can pick that up, and maybe we can go down the line. David? 
I think we often uh, look at this problem in a way that's very uh, inefficient and isn't getting to the solution. And you, in your previous uh, testimony, or your previous question, Senator, spoke to this. Um, I, I referenced the U.S. government as a legacy industry, and I, I don't say that lightly. Um, a lot of uh, established companies have actually seen it as beneficial to essentially create a startup within the company. Uh, and that's been a very successful thing for a number of, of companies to do. I'd point to uh, Intuit, the tax company, as, as one that did a very good job of creating a very interesting tax app um, where people, through their cell phone, could uh, get all the tax documents. This was, they did this something very much like what a startup would do by creating a unit which was a startup within a broader company. With respect to this specific issue, social media, I would want to see a startup within the U.S. government, something where you can get the best people on board, um, and th there are a few layers of that. Uh, one is, are we able to work with the right people? Uh, I've seen, I mean, yesterday I spent uh, the morning with um, uh, a Lebanese businessman, an owner of a media company, who had these remarkable anti-extremism uh, ads on his computer that, he, that his company had put together. Um, he knows the region well, and uh, was looking to shop them around, um, but the production value was extraordinarily high. Are we getting the right production value? Do we have the right people in place? Often multiple things make it hard to have the right people in place. So one of the things I would, I would look at is not just starting a startup, but looking at the broader rules that prevent us as a government from having the best people in place to tackle these very thorny problems. And One David, I'm going to interrupt just because I want to get through the whole panel, yeah. but anything that you would like to provide in, in the days after this hearing of, of that image you just said, and that we've got it, I, I would love to pounce on because I think you're speaking uh, not only a truth, but you're speaking an urgent truth. But just to move into uh, uh, Mubin, Mr. Sheikh. Uh, very quickly, um, uh, subject matter experts to guide and train government agencies even, uh, whether it's law enforcement, whether it's military, psychological operations, whatever it is, and ultimately autonomy of efforts on the ground to, to move at the speed of social media. Uh, if I can quote uh, Bruce Lee, you know, to be like water, formlessness, uh, autonomy. And I think that's a really important point because somebody else mentioned that, that often you delegitimize de the organic voices when you put a government, the U.S. government stamp on that. And I think it's really important to have strategies that create an atmosphere in which those organic voices can emerge without being delegitimized uh, by uh, the, the U.S. government. Uh, go, Mr. Berger. So, yeah, we're, we're getting creamed on social media, not just by, by ISIS, but also by Russia and Iran and Syria. Um, this is a difficult thing. We don't do propaganda well because we have principles that we adhere to that these adversaries don't right. uh, in terms of truthfulness, in terms of fairness. Uh, what we can match them on is volume. Um, you know, we, we talk about CSCC uh, as an effort to counter-program against these guys. They're working with a handful of Twitter accounts. What would be, what would have an impact and would get around some of the, the uh, log jams of government uh, in terms of content is would be to have hundreds or thousands of accounts that are putting out even very innocuous messaging just to get us into the space and holding a presence and we can refine the messaging as we go. I think there's risk aversion in government that that prevents us from doing things that are experimental and daring in that space. But I think if we're out there in the space first, then we can figure out where to take the ship after that. Two ideas about what to do, which are not to do with messaging, but haven't been discussed so far. One is there is sort of a good news story going on with Turkey. If you look at ISIS's English language uh, propaganda, they're now saying, you know, Turkish intelligence is not your friend. So this committee oversees the Customs and Border Protection. We should be giving every technical assistance possible to Turkey and reinforcing and congratulating them for basically changing what had been a very lackadaisical approach to being a pro more proactive approach. And the other thing we should be doing as a government, uh, which may, is to be building a database of every foreign fighter from the West, because we know from previous jihads that one in nine foreign fighters returning to the West will engage in an act of terrorism. Uh, and if that continues to be the case in this jihad, we need to know, particularly with visa waiver countries, who exactly these people are to the best of our ability. Gentlemen, thank you very much for a really, really great panel and for your work on these issues. I'm, I'm grateful. I've learned a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Senator Booker. And again, I'm, I'm very serious. We, we, need, we need to work on this, and I certainly want to engage you know, the members of the panel and, and other experts. You can 
uh, put us in touch with in terms of how do, how do we do this? You know, how, how do we set up a center of excellence? You know, how, how do, is it inside government, outside of government? Do you fund it? You know, whatever. Uh, we I need to work on this. I and, suspect it's both. Yeah, I, I agree. But again, it, it's urgent, like yeah. you said. Uh, one thing I do like to do uh, is provide the, the witnesses a, a final uh, bite at the apple here. If there's something that you want to get off your chest, you know, final, final statement, uh, I'd start with Mr. Bergen. Looking forward, we have a chance to not have a hearing like this five years from now about Afghanistan. If we change, you know, the idea that we're going to turn off the lights of our presence there in December 31st, 2016, merely because the Obama administration is going to be shortly out of office, is crazy. And the Afghans want us to stay. Uh, and uh, we were attacked from there, obviously, on 9-11. It's in our interest to stay, and I think it's in the interest of both parties to uh, say that we plan to stay. We have an agreement with the Afghans till 2024, strategic partnership agreement. The work has already been laid out. Uh, so I would, looking forward, you know, this is a proactive measure to prevent having the same kind of hearing about Afghanistan several years from now. I hope we have learned that failed states are, are not good for our security. Indeed. Uh, Mr. Berger. <laughs> I think that uh, ISIS is kind of the harbinger of, of radical social change ahead of us and that we need to sort of be prepared to see what happens when people can communicate in, in these daily routine ways with people of similar interests around the world and you can travel to join somebody in a relatively easy way. I think we're going to see social networks and, and societies that are going to be sorting themselves out into groups that are clustered around specific interests and uh, unfortunately we're seeing you know what I, I would hope would be the worst example of that is the first but uh, I think there's you know potential for a lot of uh, interesting evolution of how we deal with each other as human beings it's ahead. No I, I fear that is a future reality. Mr. Sheikh. Uh, thank you sir. Just very quickly on the uh, I guess the Muslim side of things uh, just given the things that have happened uh, we, we really need to uh, pay attention to the marginalization narrative. Uh, I mean, I think Muslims are uh, your best partners in this. Uh, I think Muslims understand that uh, we, we can't do it without each other. Uh, it's a common enemy. Um, they're not going to think twice. If, if I'm there with my family, uh, I'll be killed just along with everyone else. So we're in this together. Let's move together. Well, again, help us make those connections. Mr. Gardenstein Ross. Uh, I agree with what J.M. Berger said that we are in for an era of radical social change due to the unprecedented ability for a variety of movements to organize. And the question for us is, are we up for this new era? I think we've, we've grown content with a system in which a lot of things don't work, where we try to address problems and it gets lost somewhere in the bureaucracy and there's an interagency process and everyone's waiting for someone else to do something and what we're getting in terms of outputs is so suboptimal that if, we, if the U.S. government were a corporation, people would lose their jobs. Uh, I think the questions are, can we move fast enough? Um, are there too many bureaucratic obstacles? If so, what can we do to slash those obstacles? And are we transparent enough, both internally, in terms of getting buy-in within the government, uh, and also externally, getting buy-in publicly and in the broader world community. Uh, we've talked a number of times about how the U.S. has a bad brand. That's absolutely true. I mean, there's no question about that. But I also think that, it, it, looking big picture, we shouldn't be content with this. The U.S. is a great country. We shouldn't be content with the U.S. just having a bad brand and there's nothing we could do about it. I think that's also one of those very big issues that we should try to change and we should make sure we could have the right people in place who can bring the right ideas. And right now, even having the right people in place is something that's hard for the government to do. That should change. Well, again, you know, having come from a manufacturing background and solved a lot of problems, there's a process. It starts with laying out the reality. You know, understanding exactly what it is, then set yourself achievable goals. Uh, I think today's hearing has certainly laid out a reality here that uh, I, I wish weren't true. I wish we didn't have to face it, but uh, we can't keep our head buried in the sand. So again, I, I just want to thank the witnesses for your thoughtful testimony, your thoughtful answers to questions. Uh, Mr. Sheikh, again, th thank you for, for doing what you're doing. Thank you all for doing what you're doing. Uh, this hearing record will remain open for 15 days until May 22nd at 5 p.m. for the submission of statements and questions for the record. This hearing is adjourned.